I'm on my way to the Chicago Architecture Center. So here we go. See y'all in there. exhibit that I encounter is the City in the Snow Globe exhibit and according to the website this features more than two dozen snow globes and it features snow globes from local designers and architecture firms and they were asked to design um, a theme around embracing Chicago winters so here are some of those examples here. Um, one more thing to note um, as to why it's a winter theme is because I'm visiting now November of 2022. Now let's check out the Chicago Gallery that's located on the first floor. There are several panels throughout that display the architectural history of Chicago and the architects that um, designed Chicago. And 
this is a model of Fulton East, which I believe will be located downtown. So most likely this won't be affordable housing for most people. section is basically showing different projects that are happening throughout the city um, from an architectural perspective. The next section I'm headed to is dedicated to rethinking how urban environments utilize spaces to accommodate uh, many people and in a lot of cases in urban spaces, you have areas that are uh, more affluent and you have a lot of people who are unable to afford a lot of the places in um, big cities such as Chicago. So this is just a look at how um, some cities are trying to solve that problem and um, some of the things that we're trying to do here in Chicago, which of course is not enough, but um, there are some innovators who are trying to solve these problems. Destiny as a metropolis was soon set in 1836 
when construction began on a canal linking the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River, thereby connecting Chicago to every vital port in America. Its population exploded and Chicago became the country's fastest growing city, earning the name Lightning City for its crackling energy and Porkopolis for its primary industry, meatpacking. The city's proliferating railroads carried machinery, commodities, and lumber out of the city and brought goods and hundreds of thousands of people back. By 1870, Chicago's population had swelled to 300,000. To accommodate a burgeoning population, local builders employed a house frame made of lightweight lumber and nails, as easy to set aloft as a balloon. This balloon frame was employed for residences, warehouses, and institutional buildings, and aided a city's rapid growth. On October 8, 1871, a fire sparked and roared into an inferno a mile wide and three miles long, north to south. When the winds abated two days later, more than 17,000 buildings were destroyed, 300 people had died, and a third of the population, 100,000 people, were homeless. Newspapers called the Chicago Fire the night America burned. Surviving structures offered lessons. The wooden balloon frame buildings had aided the fire spread while brick, stone, and terracotta withstood the flames. Chicago architects began putting these materials to work. Emerging innovations, fireproofed iron, steel frames, and safe passenger elevators allowed Chicago buildings to climb above five stories. The rise of the skyscraper had begun. Louis Sullivan with Dagmar Adler pioneered structural innovations and fashioned elaborately ornamented buildings. As Chicago emerged reborn, its architects and business leaders came up with grand plans for re-envisioning the city. At the 1893 World's Fair, Daniel Burnham showcased his vision for Chicago as an orderly and humane place to work and to live. Burnham's 1909 plan of Chicago was a culmination of lessons learned at the fair. The plan offered Chicago a blueprint for growth. To this day, Chicago is renowned for Burnham's triumph, the multi-level Wacker Drive, a ribbon of green boulevards and parks. A lakefront free and clear. This influential urban design spurred an unparalleled building boom in the years after World War I and before the Great Depression. Buildings adorned with lavish materials and stylized ornamentation became architectural icons. If Daniel Burnham shaped the cityscape, Frank Lloyd Wright's Prairie School designs created an ideal of the American suburban home, pioneering an open floor plan and details inspired by the flat Midwestern plains. The spread of Nazism in Germany brought Ludwig Mies van der Rohe to Chicago, who influenced generations of architects to shed historical styles and embrace a design approach of less is more. America's entry into World War II also brought new manufacturing facilities that laid the groundwork for subsequent development. But by 1950, manufacturing jobs in the city had started to end. Chicago was transitioning to an information and service-based economy. The 1950s and 60s witnessed a massive reshaping of the city. Highway construction and urban renewal policies changed Chicago. Despite community pushback, 
Many of these government-led projects displace black, brown, and immigrant neighborhoods. Meanwhile, Chicago's downtown was being redefined. Architects pushed the height limits with modernist steel and glass buildings. In the 1970s and 80s, postmodern buildings drew inspiration from their surrounding environment and the visual language of earlier Chicago buildings while incorporating bold, playful ornamentation and dramatic symbolism. But as the 20th century came to a close and the population of Chicago neared 3 million residents, the city was faced with a new challenge. How to use design to remake the city's fabric once again, this time to better serve the needs of city residents. The success of Millennium Park and the Riverwalk have brought together architecture, landscape design, art, music, and family activities, reigniting the downtown living experience. Public spaces have become fundamental elements of a vibrant, livable city in the 21st century. Chicago is a global leader in the smart city movement, gathering varied kinds of data to inform decisions and planning. As it has been in the past, Chicago is a model and laboratory for cities everywhere. Chicago, the city of architecture. Come explore it with us. You'll never see the city the same way again. Well, they didn't really talk about the hoods of Chicago, but we'll get back to that. All right, let's head upstairs. So this is a continuation of the Winter in Chicago exhibit.
This section is called Energy Revolution and it demonstrates different um, ways that individuals, corporations, city leaders, all of us can move towards making the city um, carbon free for the future. Just by stepping on it, you can create more energy. You know I gotta try this out. I don't know how much energy I'm generating, but I definitely want one of these at my house. Let's check out the rest. And here's a new um, wind combobulator, and I'm sorry I, I didn't read what it actually is called, um, but it's small and mighty, and it's the a new way to look at how we're going to be doing wind power. So this is really interesting, and I also don't know how it works exactly. So this will be a reason for you to go up there and see it in person. Here are a few models of downtown buildings. Um, here goes the Hancock building here. And there goes Marina City and the Sears Tower, AKA Willis Tower, which nobody in Chicago calls it that. Here's a little view of actual downtown Chicago. Baby. 
of course. Let me see how much they cost. They're a thousand damn dollars each. Guess I'll have to wait on that one. Today's adventure was a lot of fun, so I guess I'll finish up by just keeping on with my personal energy inducing dance party. Well, I hope you all enjoyed today's video. And that's all for now. But please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And remember, all is one. Love y'all. I can't wait till it comes on the market.